Welcome to the seventh bus anniversary. This episode of the Flying Focus Video Bus marks seven years that the Flying Focus Video Collective has presented a half hour program featuring video as a tool for social change, voicing the voiceless. My name is PC Perry and I've been involved with uh, Flying Focus since early in 1991. Tonight you'll hear from a number of producers uh, who are members and associates with Flying Focus about programs they produced in 1997 from November to November 1998. I spent a lot of time this year along with members of Flying Focus um, working behind the scenes on issues that affect everyone who produces cable access on television. The laws that govern cable access have changed and all the stations are in danger of losing their funding uh, when contracts are up for renewal. Cable access boards have come up with different ways of trying to uh, maintain their funding, some creative and some with the effect of infringing our producers' free speech. So I've been uh, spending a lot of time at board meetings, producers' meetings, trying to make sure that our right to give voice to the voiceless on television is not curtailed. Um, this is not as much fun as going out and videotaping, but the end is the same. Uh, one of the threats to cable access comes from city council's views that nobody's watching cable access anyway. So why not give the money to the police? Um, so we spent some time compiling comments that came in from viewers during the first half of the year to share with PCA and ultimately the council. Um, and the results were quite heartening. Many of the people called to ask for copies of tapes, some called to ask questions, argue, some just wanted to call us names, but at least they were watching. It made us realize how many people are involved with Flying Focus. Many of them are people who are never seen in our shows, people who videotape, edit, crew, crew for shows, work on mailing parties, give us financial, emotional, technical support, organize demonstrations or studio shows, watch the show, call with feedback, staff lending libraries, put on video festivals. That's a lot of people we work with. We thank you all. We need you and we love you. Hi, I'm Mary Burwell and I'm here with Flying Focus Video Collective. I've been working with the collective for nearly three years regarding um, two issues, in particular women's human rights and also the death penalty. This past year I hosted a show for Flying Focus concerning some remarkable women from Portland. We have some clips from that show here tonight along with clips from two other shows concerning powerful women as well. These shows were all produced by Barb Green who is here tonight and behind the camera. The first clip you will see is from a show I hosted not too long ago, which is called Active Women. And no, it's not an exercise video. I'm going to school in writing. I also do painting and drawing and ceramics. Wow, um, I didn't so realize you did ceramics. It's just a, a, a bunch of different things. Mm -hmm. And you, do you practice art with your children? Is that something you do yes. on a regular basis? Yeah, I, um, I have a studio and um, they, when they, they come with me to the studio mm -hmm. and I paint up high and they paint down <laughs> low and we share materials and their stuff is invariably much better than mine, think so? but they, they have a freedom to the way they right. do their work. How old are they again? Uh, three and a half and seven and a half. Mm -hmm. And one boy yeah. and one girl. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And. Um, well, it's, for me, it's been extremely rewarding. I've learned um, an amazing amount about myself. Mm -hmm. And um, I've also just had the chance to work with amazing women and get to know amazing women who've come into the shelter right. and hear stories of survival that right. just are absolutely incredible. Right. Um, so that's, and it's really great to feel like you're being a part of something mm -hmm. and um, make, making a difference and also I consider the agency that I work at to be a feminist agency and we're, we're doing work that's kind of on the forefront of social change. Amnesty International uh, works on behalf of individuals who have been arrested for um, 
their their religious beliefs, for their the color of their skin, for their sexual orientation. But we only work on, on behalf of individuals who um, have never never used or advocated the use of violence. For the first right. time ever, Amnesty is going to be kicking off a campaign on the United mm -hmm. States. And we're going to be focusing on that for this conference. So we're going to be talking about police brutality, about uh, refugee and immigration issues, um, the death penalty, and uh, military security right. transfer. This next clip is from a talk given by Ramona Africa of MOVE at Laughing Horse Bookstore about uh, political prisoners here in America. Uh, Clayton Check from Portland taped Ramona Africa. In fact, that was the first show he ever taped for Portland Cable Access, and he did a very good job. Do you think that revolution means that you're a violent, mean, nasty person? Move is revolutionary, but we don't believe in violence. We are revolutionaries because we love because we love our sisters and brothers of all, you know, races and nationalities and backgrounds. We love our sisters and brothers. We love life. We love freedom. We love justice enough to fight for it, enough to protect it. You know how if you have children, you love your children enough to fight for it? Fight for your child. Well, that's how we feel about justice and freedom. You know, that's how we feel about our sisters and brothers. And that is why we are revolutionaries. Not because we hate or believe in violence. That's the system's ammo. All they know is hate, is brutality is murder and rape and robbery, you know, filling the prisons of this system, telling people, telling you and me, they don't have no money to, you know, feed people, to house people, to keep people warm when it's cold outside. They don't have no money for any of these things. But at the blink of an eye, you see prisons going up all over the place. The Pentagon submits a budget and Congress says, oh no, that ain't enough money for y'all. Y'all need more than that. And give them more money than they asked for. You don't believe me? Look it up. Check it out. This last clip is from a very intense street play performed here in Portland by a theater group called Hip Chicks and Activists. I am a silent witness. My name is Shelley Renee Vaughn. I was killed on January 31st, 1993. I was a lifelong resident of Portland as well as the mother of a six-month-old girl. My boyfriend stabbed me to death and was found walking along the freeway with our baby. My daughter was unharmed. If I was alive today, I would be 37. This scene is about the Oregon Clemency Project. There are many, many, many women in the Oregon State Penitentiary because they defended themselves against their batterers or their abusers. Some of them are even in on charges as serious as aggravated murder. The actions that they took were in self-defense. Some people have gotten together and tried to get clemency for these women to point out that what they were doing was in their own self-defense, and so therefore not the crimes that they have like supposedly committed. I'm 41 years old, I have two kids, and I'm from Eugene, Oregon. My husband battered me for 10 years. Shortly after I moved my business into our home, I had to call the police. When the officer came, he looked around, and he saw all my boxes and stuff, and he said, I'd hit you too if you kept house like this. Well, I killed my husband. He'd been choking my daughter, and he came and attacked me. And earlier, I'd bought a stun gun to protect myself with, but when I used it, it just knocked him backwards. So I grabbed his gun and I shot him. I was given a maximum of 20 years and I was given no minimum. I'm a silent witness. My name is Janice Pacellieri Achelle. I was seeking a divorce. My husband, a police officer, shot me multiple times while our newborn baby slept upstairs. Then he shot himself. If I were alive today, I would be 31 years old. 
Vanessa Rennick taped most of Witness This, a show that was very difficult to work on emotionally. She also worked on a show with Andrew Devalis, and he'll be on next to talk about that one. Producer Andrew Devalis. I understand you uh, heard about Flying Focus. How? Uh, I went to a benefit where uh, Noam Chomsky was the, the keynote speaker. It was for you and a, a couple other progressive organizations in Portland, and that was 1995. Ah. But it took me a couple of years to get around to actually volunteering. And this That's is the good. first year I've been an active producer. And you did something with uh, Vanessa Rennick. What it, program was that? Uh, By Nothing Day. Tell uh, me about that. Documentary. Um, Students at International Learning Center here in Portland organized a, an action uh, last By Nothing Day, which is the day after Thanksgiving, All right. the biggest shopping day of the year. Mm -hmm. And they, uh, they involved a lot of progressive organizations, Jobs with Justice, uh, Cross-Border labor, labor Organizing Coalition, uh, Justice, Do It Nike. And there were speakers, and then they went around Portland and basically uh, went, they went into Nike Town and uh, held an action in there, mm -hmm. uh, did chanting, basically letting consumers know that a lot of the products they're, they're buying are uh, being made in sweatshop kinds of labor conditions. Eldridge Cleaver, wasn't that something you worked on? Yeah, I got to tape Eldridge at the oh. Earth Day last year. Before he died, last program, maybe, huh? Yeah, it was a week or so before he died. Oh. And uh, uh, I learned a lot from, from listening to, to him, and I was, I was also honored to be part of that. He seemed to have a good combination of, of a civil rights activist and also someone who has a good spiritual uh, grounding and path that they're working on. Like the other day, I, I, I overheard a conversation, and there was nobody around. <laughs> it was really an argument between J. Edgar Hoover and Richard Nixon. I was really shocked. I was a little bit frightened. Because J. Edgar Hoover screamed at Richard Nixon, you lousy civil libertarian. I said, what the heck is that? He said, I told you you should have let me kill that guy. And he was talking about me. And Richard Nixon said, but I couldn't let you do that, J. Edgar Hoover. That's against the Constitution. And Hoover said, you lousy civil libertarian. 
And then Satan said, both of you shut up. <laughs> so much for politics. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, when you go from civil rights and, and human rights to creation rights, you start thinking about what politicians are doing. They're talking about consolidating a new world order. And it seems to me that as we are at a crossroads here, we have to start thinking about a new creation order that goes, be we gotta go beyond politics. I used to be a Marxist, and I used to think that all of our problems were political and economic. But at the end of the day, I found out that our problems, our main problems, are spiritual problems. If I remember, you were uh, doing something on INS too, right? Yeah, I, How'd that I, go? I also worked on the INS uh, f information forum at St. Andrews. And that, that was very, also very uh, important to uh, just for me to learn about those things and then also to get the information out there, basically. A lot of testimony was given to the INS uh, being basically using police state kinds of tactics, um, stopping people on the street just because of the way they look, um, basically of probably Mexican or Latino descent, and uh, arresting them, and you know whether they're a U.S. citizen or not, and then deciding to deport them. Right in front of me, they came out and they, they started talking to a guy and they got right in his face and said, where are you from? And he didn't even have a chance to answer before they, they grabbed him. He started filming with his wallet and they, they just grabbed him and arrested him. Pero todo sucede como quiera. Seremos ilegales o, o lo que sea, pero no hacemos daño a nadie. Y queremos que, como todos ustedes aquí, que nos ayuden a, a sacarnos de este problema. Gracias. So I'll just follow up a little bit of that in, in English. Um, basically, he said that that, um, that the immigration comes to the corner and came to the corner that day on the 9th and and beat up some people. And you know that's something that's happening happening to us. And also the, the police come to the corner and also contribute to the problem by by chasing people away. You know they're just standing on the sidewalk. And his opinion is you know they're they're here they're doing hard work. You know and they deserve deserve respect, and um, it's something that, that we need everybody's help with, you know, to fight against as a community. Um, another thing that, that I saw was that the INS had vans that were disguised as, as businesses. They had false, um, false names of businesses um, on the side of their vans, and they, they tricked people into getting in, into the van. They told them they were looking for workers. And instead, it was immigration. They took him straight downtown. Seven years. Wow, that's a long time. I only did one show this year, but it concerns an issue that's been going on almost as long as I've been working on Flying Focus. This Pekun rally took place in January of 1998, shortly before they got their first official contract. The name of the show is entitled Si Se Puede, which means Yes, We Can. And they're referring to Yes, We Can Get a Contract. So take a look at this little excerpt. What happened in 93-94 was we uh, deepened that representation at Kramer Farms, still hoping that we wouldn't have to go to a long, long, many-year boycott to bring Kramer Farms at least to the table. When that proved futile, we decided to spread the organizing to other NORPAC farms. So in 95 and 96 and 97, we held a series of strikes in the strawberry harvest, a series of work stoppages in the broccoli and squash harvest uh, at a variety at about seven or eight different NORPAC farms, and also leaf litter at another seven or eight so that a variety of NORPAC farm workers knew about the struggle. Uh, they came to do presentations at churches, unions. Some workers went with us to California and Washington. One NORPAC farm worker went with us to Washington, D.C. for a national pesticide conference. So this is how we've been keeping the workers involved. So we're still searching for the worker organizing at the NORPAC farms, but we've seen that the economic boycott is the only way that we can sustain the pressure year-round. Um, the boycotts had an effect, and what we're doing this year 
is simply trying to redouble the boycott effort. We're not necessarily trying to do a bunch of strikes and work stoppages at the farms, but we're trying to integrate workers into presentations. And specifically in the last year and this year, we're spreading uh, the boycott to Western Washington and the Midwest, and have already gotten some endorsements from some religious groups in those areas. about pesticide abuse, about safety issues regarding farm workers. The next jab is very simple. Safety, yes. Profits, no. 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 Safety, yes. Hi, I'm Hyung Nam, and um, tonight we're going to look at a couple um, shows that I produced over this last year. First one is by um, author and lecturer Michael Prenti, author of numerous books. Most recent um, is America Besieged, and um, he's done a lot of work on media analysis, foreign and social policy, and um, he gave a talk um, last year at University of Portland in September and um, it's entitled uh, Media Monopoly and Co Class Power. And um, he's witty and insightful, and he analyzes the way corporate-controlled media operate and um, the biases, what you see, what you don't see, especially um, in relation to class power and um, class, yeah, really class power. So we're going to um, take it to the clip where he's basically talking about who owns the media. Well, who owns the big media, the national media? The names that come to mind are William Randolph Hearst, Henry Luce, Sulzberger, Annenberg, Rupert Murdoch. Um, and these are people of markedly conservative orientation. I mean, there's no doubt about it. They're conservatives. They're right-wingers. By that, by right-wing, I mean they want more and more for the rich few and less and less for the working many. It's as simple as that. That's what I mean when I say right winger. Rupert Murdoch was once asked in an interview, you're considered to be, quote, you're in, in Vanity Fair, it was an interview that appeared in Vanity Fair, you're considered to be politically conservative. To what extent do you influence the editorial posture of your newspapers? Now, I thought he would respond with the usual blather, which is that, well, I might have an input, but of course I respect the editorial integrity and independence of the edit, of my staff and blah, 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 the professionalism. He said, he said, he spoke with refreshing candor. He said, to what extent do I influence the editorial policy of my newspapers? Considerably. My editors have input, but I make the final decisions. And then how refreshing, Leon's, you know? <laughs> Salzburger not punch, but the sun has taken over. You know, the sun's even more conservative. He meets every day, every day with his editors. Old man Salzberger used to call up the front page the day before and check out and challenge stories and say, no, I want this, I want that, and look at the editorials and check them out. Now, generally, the owners don't have to ride so hard on their staff because they already pick people who have, are in a state of anticipatory response and know what they want. If you always have to be reining in your editors, you fire them eventually, and you get people you don't have to rein in and who do what you want them to do. The boards of directors of the print and broadcast news organizations are populated by representatives, by members of the boards of directors from Ford Corporation, General Motors, <coughs> General Electric, Dow Corning, Alcoa, Coca-Cola, Philip Morris, ITT, IBM, AT&T, and all sorts of other corporations, interlocking directorates that resemble the boards of any other big corporations. Among the major stockholders of the three largest broadcasting networks are Chase Manhattan, J.P. Morgan Bank, and Citibank. NBC is owned by General Electric, CBS is owned by Westinghouse, 
ABC is owned by Disney. By the way, those are three of the most conservative corporations, politically conservative. Next, we're going to look at a clip of Howard Zinn, um, well-known historian and author, author of People's History of the U.S. And he was, he was in town last, or actually um, January of this year at PSU, um, talk, talking about the use and abuse of history. And we're going to look at a clip where he talks about biases in history and even in what's con considered facts in what is sele selected and not selected in presenting history. Telling them right from the start, I'm not going to be neutral because you can't really be neutral if you're, if you're supposedly neutral, uh, not taking a stand and so on. What you're really doing is you're collaborating with the world the way it is. And, 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 and if you, uh, therefore you, you know, in some way, you know, um, you have to take a stand. I, from the beginning, I did not believe in objectivity, something called objectivity. I don't mean that I, I, I believed in lying or distorting or, you know, uh, you know if, if you, you can define objectivity as not deliberately concealing information, then, then it's okay. Uh, but I certainly did not believe in objectivity in the sense of a, of a recitation of material divorced from the personal concerns and values of the teller of history. Uh, I didn't believe that objectivity was possible, and I didn't believe it was desirable. I knew it wasn't possible in, in history simply because, well, uh, the telling of history and writing history is always a selection of material out of an infinite amount of data. Thanks for joining us for part one of our seventh bus anniversary show. Join us next week at the time, same time spot for more insight into Flying Focus Video Collective and the work to educate the public on social change. Um, if you want more information and would like to get involved, please contact us. Our phone number is area code 503-239-7456, and our email is ffvc at agora.rdrop.com. Remember, part of the reason that we step in front of the camera every year is to let you know that we're people just like you. We're not executives in suits. Um, so please um, make your own TV and get involved, and see you next week.